Hey guys, today I'm going to be breaking down the Western film Assassination of Jesse James directed by Andrew Dominic and shot by Roger Deakins. If you haven't seen this film, I strongly advise you to go watch it. It is well worth your time, whether you're a film watcher, filmmaker, or especially if you're a cinematographer or photographer, this film is invaluable to you. I'll be honest with you guys, I could sit here and talk about Assassination of Jesse James for two, three, four hours, but I'm going to split this into two parts. So I may get through about four or five different shots and scenes in this video, and then we'll get into the rest, more of the second half of the film in the next video. With all that out of the way, let's jump right in. All right, guys, for starters, I just want to point out, I'm going to be doing things a little differently in this video, so I may run a little longer than the last frame by frame videos. Um, the timestamps will be on the timeline below in the description if you want to jump ahead or whatever. Um, but I'll be playing clips this time and I won't just be doing shots. So I'll play clips, I can stop and I can draw. It'd be a lot more intuitive and easier for me to show more of what's going on in the film instead of just still images like you would see in other videos. So I have the whole film on my timeline, which is great. And I have it all cut up and I'm ready to go. So uh, the biggest thing I want to start, start off with is tone. So we're just going to watch a short clip from the beginning of the film and then we're going to go from there, okay? So yeah, let's watch it. He was growing into middle age and was living then in a bungalow on Woodland Avenue. He installed himself in a rocking chair and smoked a cigar down in the evenings as his wife wiped her pink hands on an apron and reported happily on their two children. His children knew his legs, the sting of his mustache against their cheeks. They didn't know how their father made his living or why they so often moved. They didn't even know their father's name. He was listed in the city directory as Thomas Howard. And he went everywhere unrecognized and lunched with Kansas City shopkeepers and merchants, calling himself a cattleman or commodities investor, someone rich and leisured who had the common touch. He had two incompletely healed bullet holes in his chest and another in his thigh. He was missing the nub of his left middle finger and was cautious lest that mutilation be seen. And just like that, we now know who Jesse James is. It's quite staggering how let me get back to the beginning of that. It's quite staggering how, was that about two minutes and 30 seconds? We know his, his temperament, his successes, his losses, his current state, his past state, and maybe his future state. And this is the exact first two, three minutes of the film. And we have two hours and 40 minutes to go from here. So yeah, it's, it's pretty staggering how how well they blend the music from Nick Cave, the direction of Andrew Dominic, and especially the cinematography from Roger Deakins in this film. As well, I gotta mention the editors, which is, um, I have in my notes here, it's uh, Curtis Clayton and Dylan Tesh Teshiner, I think, are the editors of this film. But yeah, for starters, let's just look at the shots quickly. Um, let me pull this back up. So they ha you have these like vistas, which, which are just like, you see this a lot in um, Roger Deakins where he, he puts the horizon line like just under the thirds, the lower thirds. And of course you have, you have like Jesse just figuring out here, squeezing into the picture. But um, let me play this back for a second. Oh, hold on a second guys, sorry. Referred to as granulated eyelids let me run this back. So if you know about Jesse James, you know about this like lens effect that they had, which is right here, which is they use like a old, um, I forget the name of the lens. It's a, it's like a gold plated lens from the early 1900s that they modded to put on the, uh, the film camera. And it, it provides this like mass diffusion around the entire perimeter. And it looks like only the center of the um so right here only about here is like normally in focus as everything else just kind of ripples outward 
And this looks like a goofy sun. But um But when you watch it, it's just it's just pretty crazy. Like it starts to give everything this like vignette old age like memory feel. So whenever you have these like sequences in the film where it's like the narr by the way, the narrator is reading from the um he's reading from the book, which is this this is this is an adapted film. Um they they tend to use this lens effect on everything. So like right here with the chair and the light. It just they seem like um they remind me of like Andrew Wyeth paintings, to be honest. Like they kinda have that just like that cascading um blurriness of everything, like especially here. Like if you look here, like like I said, he's he's in focus. I mean, roughly his probably only about here is truly in focus. And then everything else after that, it just starts to completely ripple out into pure distortion and vignetting. Um, but when you combine this with the music, the narration, and the sequence of imaging, and especially just Brad Pitt's sto Brad Pitt uh, stoic acting, acting he's doing here. Um, it, it does a lot for the audience. I mean, you can convey a lot of the story just in these short memory sequences. And for most people, uh, when you when you've seen this film for the first time, the key scenes you remember is this scene, and there's a couple more that, that sprinkle in. And you don't get to like get that much out of Jesse's character, to be honest. But these scenes kind of like put you back on like a bedrock of who Jesse is and where he's at. Which I think is really cool. And I've seen this film plenty of times and every time these, these scenes blow me away. So. Let me move up to the next shot. Okay, so. For here, this is going to be shot two. Scene two, basically. Um, this one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it play as well. Because this is probably the most memorable scene in the entire film. And this is directly after the scene we just saw. So, Alright, let's run it. stop right there yeah absolutely amazing scene gets you every time but uh like i said the previous scene gets us into the psyche of jesse and then this is getting us into the myth of jesse which is really really key here so if we if we run through the scene quickly let's mute it go right here go up a little bit so it's just doing all these little key things to get you into the character um, you may have noticed already that pretty much the, this entire scene was lit by these lanterns right here. Um, and you'll see like there's more spots of them out here. Pretty much most of the gang members in the scene are carrying lanterns on them that are enveloping the scene. I assume that they had some type of practical bulbs that they, that they replaced these lanterns with because they wouldn't be using um, old lanterns like this and they wouldn't be this bright on camera. Because um, if you look at the specs on the film, which you can look up on, um, there's a site called Shot on What, 
and you can just search most films and it'll pop up and it tells you everything. But what I found on that site is it says that this film was shot on Kodak Vision 2, which is a 100T ISO, 200T ISO, and 500T ISO. I assume maybe the scene was the one with the highest ISO. So maybe they're only working with 500T ASA or ISO. That's just the film stock. So they're working with tungsten stock. So that means that if this bulb was at tungsten, if it was at 3200 Kelvin, it would appear white. So these bulbs have to be even warmer than that. So these could be like 2000 Kelvin or 2500 Kelvin to just get, get a slight warmth on screen. Um, Cause on the, I'm not sure if they use any daylight stocks, they probably didn't. But from what I looked at in IMDB and shot on what, um, it appears that they only use tungsten, which is quite staggering to be honest, because most of this film is enveloped in like warm t warm tones and warm lanterns and warm practical lights pretty much everywhere so all right so let's move up ahead on this get rid of that so he puts his head up to the the railing to just kind of like build the myth of jesse james like he's just listening for the train because this is the train robbery scene but we get to the like this the train coming in and all these guys their lanterns set up and I just love these shots like this where it just the camera just kind of pushes in slow right onto the character. You, you see this all the time at Roger Deakins films. He always has these slow dolly shots on people's faces and key scenes. And you'll notice too, like even the light on his face, it's not it's not flickering that much. So that probably tells me that it's more of a it's probably more of a modern bulb, to be honest. Like the little flicker here and there, that's probably attached to like a dimmer box or something. Someone's like pushing it up and down or something. Because there's no way they would have been able to get the scene done with um, old time bulbs. So then the train comes in. And this shot is just absolutely staggering. Um, they talk about this, this shot in uh, Roger Deakins podcast. You guys should check it out. It's a good companion piece to this video. I mean, you're hearing it from the man himself, but uh, Roger Deakins has a podcast where he gets interviewed by Greg Frazier, who's another DP. And early in the podcast, this is like one of the first scenes they start talking about. And Roger Deakins mentions he even gets emotional thinking about this scene because this is one of, the, one of the, the scenes he's most proud of, to be honest, working with Andrew Dominic on this. And they must add a massive Fresnel... Uh, lens, not lens, uh, my bad, light right on the front of the train. And they mentioned in the podcast that this was shot on a stage in, I think, England. So yeah, you can see it here. If you can see that. You can see just the outline of it. But it's it's had to be at the 500T stock, possibly, just to get that blast of light coming in. And then it gets to Jesse. And this shot where it attaches to the train, that's just just the icing on the cake, to be honest. Because they mentioned in the podcast that they're trying to, they wanted this train to be like a living, dangerous, violent machine in the film, but they didn't really get that across 100% in the final scene. So like the director was kind of upset with that. But in the end, like it's more, I think this scene's more about Jesse than it is the train. Even though this this film is about the end of the the Western era, so it's like the trains are coming. It's a good symbol of that. And yeah, Jesse moves up and then stands, and then you just get this iconic shot of the film in him sil in silhouette. I go back to that. Oh, let me just play it back. Yeah. So whenever you see this film, like you see a post online, you the people will always post this image. And it's funny, the, the simplest, most precise, clearest shots are always the ones that stand up the most in cinematography. You can look at your favorite films, usually the shot that people point out, like you'll see it everywhere, whether it's like marketing posters, where it's usually like the shot that encompasses the film in one single image down to the most simplistic genius terms of it. So here you have him in silhouette, and then around him is just the forest cascading out. You can't see any of the gang members. And it's just a it's just a lone gunslinger in shadow holding a lantern. And it looks like 
his days are ending. Then that's essentially the film in one shot, which is awesome. Yeah, I don't think there's much else to talk about this shot. I mean, other than it's just absolutely amazing. <laughs> so let's move on to the next one. So we're going into the train now. This is later in the film. So I'll actually let me play this out. So what happens here is Jesse moves into the train robbery and then he gets kind of like resistance from this back train hand who really doesn't want to work with him or give him the money or show him where it is. So th this is like the first part of the film where you get to see the more psychotic side of Jesse James. All right, so I'm going to play from here. You down on your knees. Why? But you ought to pray. I'm going to kill you. Get out! You're going to have to make me. Don't shoot him. All right, I'm gonna stop right there. So yeah, right there and there. This is like what you'd be used to in like a Coen Brothers type of film with, with shot by uh, Deacons, which interestingly, this film came out in the same year as There Will Be Blood and No Key Country for Old Men, which you can kind of put all these three films together in like the same modern Western type of feel genre. So this shot right off the bat is just, absolutely amazing with the blood coming out of his head so you see here that it's it just does that dolly push again that i was talking about earlier where they're doing it again on his face here which is just you're getting this like key center frame shot of the of the main character as it just pushes into him and you'll see it drags on for like three four or five seconds goes all the way from like a medium close-up all the way to like what you call a close-up or possibly extreme close-up and it's mirrored with this shot which is the man he killed and and here you're really just it's really just setting setting home the tone of jesse james like people look at him as an outlaw and a hero in the film but a lot of the imagery and the way they tell the story is they're trying to show like multiple different sides of him i mean again this is only the second scene in the film it's like second or third scene i think oh yeah there's a scene previous to this where they're getting ready for the bank robbery i forgot about that so within like a 20 minute span of the film you have you have a three-dimensional character off the bat you have the outlaw of jesse james which is like the mythical imaging you have like the psychotic murderer test side of jesse james and then you also have the uh, melancholic like aging depressed man image of jesse james which you saw in the first scene so uh yeah great stuff already off the bat and as you can see pretty much the um the principles that have been seen in the cinematography so far in the film are present in almost every scene i've shown you so far like you have these practical warm bulbs again it's like all they did is they just they, they just thought of the characters, like where would you be in the train, where in what period, where would the lights be, what would they use, and how can we keep it like cohesive and keep a certain like tone and color palette. So you'll see again and again on this film, there's just this use of like practical old century, warm bulbs, lanterns, scattered across every scene, whether it's a dialogue scene, anything indoors towards nighttime or near the end of golden hour you'll see these warm bulbs pop up again and again and to me they're just beautiful like that's all you really need all right on to like scene three that i want to show you in the shots this is the meeting between jesse and ed miller ed miller was the guy with the mask on in the previous scene who was saying don't shoot him he was kind of like disobeying orders right there for a bit um but throughout the film it starts to become a story in the first 
half of the film, Jesse just becomes paranoid and he's looking for the, like the rats in the group of the gang. Cause actually that, that train robbery is the last time in the film you see the gang wholly together and like working together. Like from that then on, it's just deceit, envy, jealousy, all these things happening between all these different characters. But Jesse's gonna go meet with Ed Miller just to uh, see where he's at and basically gauge if he's a rat or not. So you, I'm gonna play this scene as well. So you ain't much of a housekeeper, are you? He didn't just happen by. Why not? All right, I'm stopping it right there. So there's a lot of little details in that scene. Um, for starters, this is Ed Miller guys waiting in a shack for Jesse to arrive to talk to him. He is a rat of the group, so he's obviously like under intense stress because he's standing in front of like a major outlaw. Um, but you'll notice like key differences here is the way these guys are lit. So if you go back a little ways, so it opens with this shot of like Jesse kind of like folding into the landscape through a dissolve. This is very similar to like what you would see in like a John Wayne Western or something or like Lawrence of Arabia with like vast distances. And it's a simple like. These shots are great. You see them all the time in Hollywood. These frame within a frame shots. A lot of times you'll see them like in the middle of a film, but you're not like it's talking in your head saying like, hey, this is a frame within a frame. So right here is this completely black negative space just kind of pulling your eye forward. It's almost like it's a scene within the film that's in four by three for like a second or two. So then Jesse kind of rides in. And again, it's just more imaging throughout the film that that's building up this like mythical image of Jesse James, which really seeps into your brain as you watch it. And again, the film has like a very slow meandering pace. So a lot of like the mythic dreamy imagery really keeps you interested, I'd say. And you'll see as you come in, it's all about blocking. So like Jesse's going over here, so he's going to get a different lighting since he's standing away from the door. So now since that he was looking outside to like a gloomy sky, gloomy sky, sun, whatever. But look at him. He's he's hard lit right here. So you'll see. That's very harsh highlights on his head. That's not something you would normally do. And the other other side, he, yeah, he's got some like neg fill over here. But this lighting here is clearly for his current character state. So his current character state is he's under distress and he doesn't know if he's going to make it out of here. Like he doesn't know if Jesse's coming to kill him. That's why he looks at the gun. And right off the bat by the way he looks, the way he's dressed, the building he's in and especially now the lighting it's all telling the audience he's a wreck he's disheveled and he doesn't know what to do and again you'll see this a lot with like like some of the best filmmakers like roger deakins or whatever is they tend to work with people like production designers costume designers actors directors everybody who has like a cohesive vision towards like the current emotion like they they stay focused on the current scene so the current scene is Ed Miller thinks he's going to die. How do we convey this across all facets of filmmaking? We don't just put him in a normal shack and then have him all stressed out and just light him normally. No, we want to light him harsh. We want to make the shack disheveled. We want to make him look disheveled. We want to give him disheveled clothes. Once you do it across the board, you get way more of an emotion out of the audience from just the simplest things. So you play this out and now you'll see like when you get to Jesse, look at him. He's lit completely different. He's standing near the same window. You know? Like, theoretically, if they're standing near the same window and they're they're here and here, and there's a there's not a window, a uh, window on a door, my bad. They should look the same, lighting-wise, but they don't. 
and you'll see he's got a soft like simple like chiaroscuro lighting on him but right here he's got he's got the famous like triangle under the eye like just elegant clean soft soft painterly lighting on his face because right here with the light coming in on, on him he's the one in control of the scene so for him to be lit like this it makes complete sense it makes a complete emotional sense within the context of the scene oh, that's a key thing here and it just stays like this and then as you go throughout the scene where i can just skip ahead a little bit there's the gunshot i was talking about you go ahead a little bit to this okay so we'll go over here Let's skip this then they move to a different position i mean still he's lit a little more elegantly he's leaning back he's like he's kind of in glee like he's in control he's also wearing like black like he's like the arbiter of death you know and you get back to ed miller just in a second and look at this guy he looks like a skeleton like again his lighting on his face right here it's a little harsher i don't know I, i'm not seeing the same soft lighting around his face i'm not seeing the same you know whichever pretty much this side of the room this side of the shot just a simple shot reverse shot is a completely different mood than jesse's shot and this carries throughout the scene and there's one more thing i want to show you in this scene which i think is pretty just fantastic i'll actually i'll play it for you guys from here because you gotta you gotta you gotta honestly feel it. <laughs> well, you and me ain't been just real good friends lately. That's not your fault, you understand? But yeah. you talk though. Talk. People tell you things. that that right there that's what i was waiting to show you guys this man's about to get killed basically there's a scene coming up where jesse's like let's go for a ride and go and he kills him in the night and it's just that simple like how long does this last watch well, and an you never see it again so he's just this guy knows it's the end and just to include a shot of of him looking right like let's say this this may have just been practical this may have just come up on the shoot i mean the guy who plays ed miller may have just looked out the window in the shot and let's say roger had the decision like hey let's shoot this and it's just little things like this um they may have not been storyboarded but maybe they have but they're just they add so much to the scene like once once He's talking to Jesse and it's getting a little more intense and, they're tr and Jesse's trying to like pry this guy to find out what happened with the rest of the gang members. Just switching to a shot of the window, at him just glaring at the window, kind of like looking at the light outside, just to like get his last glimpse of life adds so much to the scene. And you just go from a simple like, are you a rat scene to something more emotional and you really feel it to the audience. So... It's good stuff. Let's move to the next shot. Okay, so for this shot, um, this is another like pretty key emotional scene, like little moments throughout the film. Um, Jesse's still on like his quest to like find out what happened with the rest of his gang members. There's a lot of like weird backstabbery going on in the first half of the, half of the film. But um, he goes here and he's trying to get information about, I think it's Ed Miller. And he ends up like beating up a little kid here. It's like a little farmhand kid who's related to him. And... The, uh, his other member right here, Dick Little, just is like kind of perplexed. Like, why did you just beat that kid up? But um, here's Jesse's reaction returning to his horse after he just like beat up a helpless kid, basically. Okay, so let's see. My mind's all tangled in my little deals like this just make me feel dirty. Are 
you all right, Jesse? So yeah, that right there, that's one of the main scenes in the entire film you'll ever see Jesse get like a motive about stuff. Like even later in the film with, um, spoiler alert, Bob Ford kills him. He's completely at peace with it. But this is like probably the only scene in the film you get to see him like emote completely. But um, again, back to simple fundamentals. Uh, so here, let me think I go back a little more. Yeah, right about here. Um, oh, I thought it was a dolly push. It's actually not a dolly push, my bad. But the thing is, is this, like if you were on the other side of the horse, right? And he's crying in the scene and you just film, film his face from the other side crying. And let's say like past him, you can see Dick Little watching. It wouldn't have nearly as much emotion. Like just him walking back to the horse slowly, cameras moving around and then you just see him go to the horse and he doesn't get up and then he stops. It's it's really just, that's all you really need from the scene. I mean, there's not much to talk about here other than like the vistas and the, the location is perfect. And it looks like, honestly, it looks, looks like lighting right here. It looks like they possibly are on a stage. I'm not entirely sure because that does not look like natural um, sun lighting in this weather. It would be more like his whole face would probably be enveloped because if you look at the sky, the sky looks completely cloudy. But again, it's a movie like people like I can point that out pausing right now, but you wouldn't be able to notice that if you're watching it. So, yeah, this is probably some background then maybe green screen. Who knows? But it's just simple camera movement like with with Roger Deakins, a lot of his films like he gets praised a lot by a lot of cinematographers because he just he keeps it down to the, the bare simplicity. Like if there's an emotion or if there's a dialogue between two key characters about a key subject, like he doesn't shoot it in like nine, 10 angles. He shoots it in just like his shot, let's say her shot, and then maybe another shot or like one big shot in the scene that emotes the final thing, like one big dolly push or one key close up, or like in the last scene, one key just like glance out a window for the current character. And then again, the scene ends with another like iconic mythic image of Jesse where he just kind of like rides into the sun, like like basically the last cowboy. So again, look at the composition here. You have the the land's horizon going from the upper left third all the way down to the bottom right third, which kind of splits the image in half. And then you just have these perfectly placed trees just kind of cascading out of the ground. And then the sun right here takes place perfectly on the upper left third so for someone who like if you're like western a lot of people don't know this um composition is entirely dependent on like pretty much like your reading eye like we read left to right right so a lot of times with composition i mean i learned this from a professor but you you'll naturally place like key stuff left to right and if you watch like let's say you watch japanese cinema they read right to left. So a, a shot like this, if they were doing, like let's say Roger Deakins was Japanese and this was a Japanese film, he would have put him over here. Possibly, if he, if he can, if he can get a hill, if he can get on the other side. But yeah, it's just, it, it's 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 an interesting thing. Like next time you see shots you like, like let's say from a Japanese film or shots you like from a Western film, pay attention to like where things are placed. like. A lot of times it has to do with like our natural instinct and tendencies because again when we're out on the field and we're shooting this we don't pull up like a th rule of thirds overlay on the on the the eyepiece like no you just naturally place tripod you get your shot placed and you just naturally put stuff where you think they're pleasing to your eye which a lot of it has to do with your trained eye from like reading reading words looking at other photographs and a lot of it's all culture and placement and it's all instinctual at the end of the day. So let's get out. Of, let's get out of here. Let's go to the next shot. Okay. So the last scene I want to show you in this video has to do with a intense dinner scene between Jesse and Robert Ford. Robert Ford is withholding information about uh, one of the gang members that he shot during a dispute, but Jesse doesn't know about this. 
and this scene really shows the character of Robert Ford and then also how they clash quite strongly him and Jesse. So I'm just gonna play from here. How could I have known he had a grudge against me? How could I have known he was lying to get on my good side? I said, George, come on aboard. Glad to have you. George thought he was smart, except he wasn't. One morning, George rides into camp, and about 20 guns open up on him. <laughs> <laughs> See, old George, you only have one eye. You got two eyes, you want to get Jesse. <laughs> You ought not think of me like you do, George Shepard. You brought him to mind. So there you go. It's a complete drawn out scene uh, carried between Robert Ford and Jesse James. Robert Ford starts to wax on poetically about himself and things he's done. And obviously Jesse sees right through it. And that's the key thing in the film is Robert Ford is kind of like a charlatan or a fakie or a fanboy of Jesse James. And that kind of eats at the relationship. And that's what drives the eventual envy, which leads to the him killing Jesse James because they're trying to cover up all the ratting that they're doing in the background and stuff like that. But um, the thing about this scene is that they're doing really simple things that I was talking about earlier, where it's like, you don't need much more than these two shots with this close up shot on Jesse. And you'll notice it gradually gets closer as the scene progresses. Like if we zoom back over here, it's getting a little glitchy. Hold up. So like, and then they also have this like intercutting shot of Sam Rockwell's character basically laughing at everything that Jesse says just to build the tension of Jesse basically talking down to Robert, like telling this story about this, this useless guy, which he's basically implying is Robert. And of course, like Jet, uh, Robert says, like, you don't think of me that way, do you? And he's like, well, he came to mind. But um, it's really all you need when you have actors these sk like this skilled. Like, what more do you need than just like a top practical warm light in a room with your costumes on in a shack and just keep the focus on the current scene and the words and the acting. And you can even see here in this shot right here, like you can see again, there's like these practical bulbs again. I mean, this is probably not lighting up them. It's probably more in the side over here, like behind Sam's character. And if I go all the way back, let me get rid of that. You go all the way back to like way before the scene started. You now can see like more of the table. So like right here, the lights up there but there's also like there's also a light up here that's basically enveloping them for this scene it's probably not like what we were seeing earlier in the train scene where it's just like practical bulbs it's probably like an actual just big square fixture fixture my bad fixture so for this it's probably something like this where it's a it's a large, soft, warm fixture above them, like probably a soft box or something. And it's just supposed to emulate that like light, big chandelier above them that's soft lighting them. And when you have scenes like this, you have like, I mean, what do you have here? You have six people at the table, but they're all spread out evenly. So like he's standing across from her, he's standing across from her, and then he's standing across from Jesse. So you really need, in order to make it work, you need like a rectangle that like goes, I mean, it's hard to see here cause it's like 2D, but it would just kind of like draw down onto all the characters. And then you get that nice, that's why you can see on their heads, you get that nice like temple light that kind of cascades down. Like you'll see the, the bright spot is on his forehead. Um, and that kind of goes down. And a lot of times if you don't, if you're trying to analyze a film and you don't know like where the light is or like what type of light they use, it's it, like human skin reflects really well. So it's really easy to just look at somebody and see where the bright spots are on their face. And then it gives you a good idea of like where the light possibly was or what type of light it is. I mean, again, when you're watching a film, it's pretty much impossible to know what light they use. Like I can't say like, oh, this was an RE, whatever. I, I, you can't do that. But as long as you narrow it down to like, oh, it's a soft light or oh, maybe it's a big bank fixture above. I mean, 
that that really narrows it down so when, when you're doing references for other films i recommend just doing this process of finding out what light was used like let's say you have a lookbook for a film um if you just have like a rough idea of like it was a soft small practical to the side and you want to emulate something similar to that to like say a shot of something you're going to work on you have so many options available to you that you can kind of narrow down and test and get get a similar look because again uh, people don't talk about it commonly in cinematography but like this setup right here this is not new like roger deacons didn't create this setup like he doesn't own the the right to build a big soft source above a table and light people this is something that you'll see again and again in tons of hollywood movies i mean a good example of this is like the hateful eight like most of that film takes place in like that that big barn that they're in and a lot of the film is just like a big soft or hard source above them just lighting down at the table and then like bouncing up at their face so almost every hollywood film unless um someone has a different process a lot of people work with lookbooks and references from other films or photographers and the practice of you trying to replicate this like let's say you took this shot and you try to replicate it you going out there and trying to replicate this look or like this table scene or this light off to the side or whatever you naturally will do it differently you'll have different lights you might have different exposure different output on the light different setting you naturally will get your own look that's a little different and people aren't going to come at you and call you up and say like hey you copied this shot no nah, that doesn't happen in the cinematography world everybody learns from everybody as long as it's work you admire so and to prove it even more to you guys i can go even further back and i'm pretty sure there's a shot back here that shows us the whole table just gotta give it a minute it's like being a little glitchy so as you go back you'll see yeah so now you see the table see so look at that that's a little interesting so here's the bulb right here right so i can't tell if this is hold on a second this looks if you look at the reflection on him there it looks a little different than what it does in the future scene so sometimes people do this when they shoot stuff they have like a wide shot where they light it a certain way and shoot it a certain way but then when they go in for the close-ups they sweeten it like they either change the light or add more lights or stuff like that it's very common so you can take a mental image of what the lighting looks like on this guy right here all right and now we'll move up ahead and we'll see if we can get a shot of him Yeah, to me it looks a little different it looks like he's got more soft light on him here than he does in the previous wide shot yeah so it's a little darker under his face here and stuff like that so a simple thing like that that tells you that the light you see here is possibly not the same light you see in the next couple shots so and there could also be you never know there could also be like lights hidden under here like little led soft lights that kind of cascade out i mean you could do all types of tricky shit and shot that you can't see but i'd say hunch wise in a future close-up shots that come after this they probably swapped it out for a bigger softer more precise modern fixture that they were using and yeah guys i don't there's not much else to say about this scene i mean it's pretty self-explanatory especially if you keep in mind the concepts that i'm saying and then you just watch the scene out you can pick up a lot more than what I'm telling you right now. Yeah, so that's all I got for you guys today. I'm going to be doing a part two of this video where I'll be covering the second half of the film, things leading up to Jesse's death, and then also the epilogue about Robert. I hope this video was helpful for you guys and you got something out of it. Um, and let me know if you like this type of long form content and the way this one was done. And uh, if you like this, check out my Info In The Mood For Love video. And I also have A Serious Man, which are the two other films I've done in this series. And uh, yeah, with all that out of the way, have a great day, guys. Peace.